after finishing Purple Rain and all that, I my check was like $330. The Ice Cream Castle album, I'm produced by Jamie Starr, co-produced by Jesse Johnson. It wasn't on there on the publishing shit. I don't even think Jungle Love said my name on the record, though, or came off years ago, because he was, Prince was vindictive when you left him. So many people read Purple Rain as an autobiography. You know, yeah. that was Al Magnolia's story. Uh -huh. And we used parts from my past and my present life to make the story pop more. Right. It was off the sides, but it was a story. There was a school right there that's going to elementary school. Those are my mommies. Are you close with her now? Do you, do yeah, more so with my father. My dad's real serene. He never swore, still doesn't. He never drinks. Mm -hmm. It takes music to get him going. I mean, my dad would have nothing to do with guns. You should notice when you meet him. He's a little sick now, I guess. And mm -hmm. Of course, we're one of the same. Do you stop by and see her very often? Not as much as I see my dad. Are they friends? No. No. When Paisley Park was being built, we had a conversation where he actually said, could you imagine if we all lived close by? meaning the band and the, the crew and management. And just think, every time we wanted to shop, we could just go to the nearest mall and have them close it down. And we would just have them all do our... And he was being dead serious. It was like we should have this insulated environment where all of us, and then we'll, we'll get somebody to, to home teach all our kids. You know, it was like, it really was dead out of Howard Hughes. It was scary. Yes, I made out with Prince on stage. It's probably more of a claim to fame than anything. There was a little acting going on. Yeah, we'd have the scene where I go hug the bass player. He's a man, and I'd go kiss the keyboard player. She's a woman. You know, I didn't have any problems with kissing a superstar on stage. Didn't you guys have a relationship? I go, no. And one night, and towards the end of the tour, at one of the after show parties, he, he grabbed Gail Chapman and tried to get her going, if you know what I mean. That upset Prince. I was there. Rick was actually very nice to me and invited me to breakfast, and then he invited me onto his tour bus to view the cover of his new album. I did not know that I was not supposed to do any of this. Prince found out what I was doing and went into a rage and demanded that I get off the bus. I was sitting there in a booth. Rick is saying, so what do you think of my new album cover? I said, I like it. Next thing you know, somebody's on the bus saying, Gail, Prince wants you now. I said, now? He wants you off the bus now. Well, Rick, I thank you. It was great. See ya. Bye. Talking about putting women in lingerie. So all of a sudden, we're going to do this. And Gail, you're going to do this. Prince was tired of the costumes that I was coming up with. And he sent his girlfriend down to the hotel room I was in. And she sweetly came in, dumped this bag of metallic underwear on my bed and said, Princess, wear this or you're fired. And I looked at her and I said, you got to be kidding. She says, no, he's not. Yeah, head was coming out. I'll admit, I didn't really want to sing it. I suggested a word, a few word changes in the song. And Prince said, no, it's my damn song. We're going to sing it my way. I said, fine, I don't want to sing it. I left just prior to it coming out and him hiring Lisa. So Lisa's picture is on the back, but in the credits, my name is, is there. And I felt boxed in. And people have intimated that I left because of religious reasons. Uh, didn't want to sing the song. Excuse me, it's a song about a blowjob. Not everybody wants to sing a song about a blowjob. Okay, so I'll admit, I didn't really want to sing it. I suggested a word, a few word changes in the song. And Prince said, no, it's my damn song. We're going to sing it my way. I said, fine, I don't want to sing it. That was pretty much the end of that. I got up one day and I just knew I was going to give notice. Called him up one morning. We talked for about an hour in his living room and he's got a lot going for you. I don't think you'll have any problems finding anybody to take my place. If I'm going to quit, it's going to be now because it's going to be better for you as far as timing to find somebody. Then he was able to find Lisa fairly quickly. So that worked well. And yet the last thing he said to me was, Gail, if you ever need help with anything, you just call me. I was never able to get a hold of him. <laughs> they told me that she became uncomfortable with the subject matter. I just didn't want to sing those words. It's like, okay, now what, genius? I wrote the music on it on the song Dirty Mind. He just wanted my flavor. The song Dirty Mind happened because we were jamming at the rehearsal space one day, and I just happened to hit that chord progression improvising. Once we completed Dirty Mind, he had me come back another day and played the solo on the song Head. <laughs> I felt like I was on some different end of the spectrum because other people that were involved were making money, you know, and getting credit. And I, I felt, you know, on the outside of that. 
I know as far as the music was concerned, some of that stuff came out of jam sessions because we jam a lot. I have some of those jam sessions where I'm playing and a lot of the stuff is not exactly the same, but very similar. For a second album, I used Andre, my bass player, on Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad. I'm not trying to take any credit. It's not like Prince couldn't have wrote that stuff without me, or it's not like I can't write stuff without him. Or, but I have this stuff. These are original versions. It's me playing on them, but eventually they become me not playing on them. It's the same thing. It's just that instead of me actually playing on them, it says somebody else is playing on them but it's the same stuff. And so, I mean, that's where it got a little bit weird. It'd be like if I had a jam session with my band and my band were just jamming and came up with these parts. And then I came and said, oh, great part. I'll play them all. Something about that don't seem quite right. There was a typo error and you didn't get credit. But I tried to explain that to him. There's no explaining too much of anything. Then later on, Prince puts out Do Me Baby and claims it. Of course, Andre was upset about it. Andre had originally did that track. At the time, we had written so much stuff together that I never really thought about. And I didn't really understand publishing and all that other kind of stuff. I was, you know, it's, you know, um, it's just not, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, and it's not, you know, and, and the thing is, is that there's recordings of it, you know. I have recordings of, of the song that I did. He knew a good idea when he took it. He wanted to be a solo artist like Prince. He didn't like being just a side man. He didn't want to wait several years for Prince to succeed and be the guy that was Prince's right hand man, side man, best buddy, slash whatever. And I, I literally did the last part of Prince's tour for free. So I didn't make any money. Um, so I was like straight broke. In this situation, I can't really live the kind of life I want to live. I have aspirations and goals. I never thought I was going to be in somebody's band where I have to wait for somebody to kick me down. It's not my personality. I ain't really making no money. Somebody else has a house with, with this dope shower and this dope tub, dope car. I'm like still at my mom's crib. And I know I'm all involved in everything. And it's like, I'm starting to ask those questions. I can't even really take my girl to the movies. This ain't making no Hey, you know what? I wish you all the best. I wound up seeing, you know, a bass player and said, you might want to go check this guy out. And that guy wound up being a bass player. People tell a whole different story. And maybe it was different. I have no idea. All I know is that's what I did because I didn't want to leave because he was still my friend. I didn't want to leave him with nothing. So, you know, I literally went to some clubs in Minneapolis, saw a guy that had a similar style and gave him a heads up. With Andre, Prince actually told me he came home. I, I lived with Prince's girlfriend, Kim Upshur. We all kind of lived together like you do when you're in your 20s. And he said, I fired Andre. I was like, you can't fire Andre. <laughs> he's your brother. Yes, I can. And I did. And he's not in the band anymore. And we're going to get a new bass player. And, you know, he got really serious. I think he was freaked out himself, you know, because he just got a little bit more mean. Well, I have a mean side. Try to like, you know, convince everyone that that, was, that had to happen. Mm, I don't know. I just need to see if there's a place for me to do what I need to do. Because I was always writing my own music. I was always doing my own thing. And I never thought I was going to be in somebody else's band not doing my own thing. He was doing his thing. That was his thing. And I know how Prince was strong man you know I mean he would like wrestle you down and you know maybe Andre was just sick of competing you know you know I'm a fighter I'm very competitive but from my little perspective you know I know that my last gig with Prince's band was in France okay. and um, that's why I left my trench coat and you know and called it a day and Andre was his best friend when Andre left he got weird, man. Like during the Dirty Mind period, there were times when I would go into fits of depression and get physically ill behind him. Somehow and call people to come help me out of it and things like that, but I don't do that anymore. You, you really couldn't talk to him after that. What about it, everybody, for Mr. Andre Simone? You started with the group Prince. Could you tell us how the split came about? I just wanted to try a new direction. You know, I'm bringing some new music. As are you guys still friends? No, we're still friends. Good friends? Mm hmm I saw you at the show, uh, at the 20 Grand. What about uh, the group Time? Well, I was going to produce Time. Uh-huh. Put it that way. Morris and Prince had called me and asked me to have a meeting with them. So Prince called a, a dinner 
at uh, Perkins Cake and Steakhouse. I, I hate to break it to you, my man. It wasn't Perkins. I, I'm going to take you back. Sambo's on Lake Street. We went to this restaurant called Rudolph's. So anyway, we sit down. And we're all going to have dinner, basically. And Prince is going to kind of lay out the game plan of what we're going to do. But Alex always speaks in the third person. Me to sit back and be past him. That would have been Alexander O'Neill. We've ordered food. Prince is buying some. Alex orders a big steak. So Alex goes, okay, Prince, before we get started and things like that, Dad, you know, I had a few things I didn't want to get off my chest. I thought that, you know, we were in a position where we were close to getting a deal ourselves because we were in the studio doing things. I was questioning them about their decision to be the time. Alex couldn't see eye to eye with, with Prince about the paper. <laughs> you know, Prince, I need the paper. I need some paper, Prince. Alex really showed his butt and said he wanted to know how much paper was involved. And Prince wasn't having it. You know, it wasn't about that. The paper's going to come later, but right now, you know, we're trying to build this pen. And we're all, like, looking at Alex, like, what What are you doing, man? And he's like, here's the thing. See, now, Alexander O'Neill, you know, first of all, Alexander O'Neill need, you know, I need a new house. I started asking questions in reference to the financial aspect of, of this venture. Yeah, I need a moving thing. You know, Alexander O'Neill need, you know, I just need some things. You know, I know this, this whole record thing is real cute and, and all that stuff there, but, this, you know, Alexander O'Neill needs some things. You know what I'm saying, Prince? You know, Prince, that's just the way I see it, so I'm going to go ahead and throw down and see a steak. He threw down the steak. Prince and Morris look at each other and leave the restaurant. So now we're like going, man, what are you doing, Alex? Just, you know, trying try to point out a few things, you know. Here's the way it is with Alexander O'Neill. You know, if there's a bear in the woods and Alexander O'Neill, you better help the bear because you ain't got to help Alexander O'Neill. Alex was supposed to be the singer. Yes. Alexander O'Neill. Yes. Xander wanted oh, no Zander. paper. Yeah. We didn't have the paper. Yeah. So Xander said, no, no Xander. Right. So long story short, I got fired. So consequently, obviously, I guess Prince taking an the attitude that you have the nerve to question me. Uh, I went to rehearsal one night and he said, we're not going to have a session tonight. Morris and I are going down on First Avenue. And he gave me $50 and I was out. <laughs> and that was it. And Alex was done. Bean was the drummer. He got the word. We were playing hit, and I was just playing it how I thought it sounded to me, which was a mistake. You know, boom, bum, 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 like that, right? That joke turned around, looked at me, circled back, bam, I was like, oh. And I felt, I was like, did he just kick me? I was like, did he, did, did he just kick me? So we start playing. Comes back around again. I, You know, he circled around, I didn't see him. All of a sudden, bam, pointed toe boots, dead in the crack, the crack. And I was like, oh, I turned on that time. I was like, oh, oh I'm going to bust him up now. Now you messing with my manhood. Now you test him. You know, I'm six feet tall. He's five two. You know, so I was like, are you, you going to throw this away right now? So I was ready to beat him down. And he came back around again. You know, and this time I was ready for him. But he whispered in my ear, told me what I needed to do. He grabs me by the ear, you know, and he starts cursing in my ear. And he tells me to play the bass or I'll find somebody who will. I was just sitting there steaming and I was boiling. So I left. I went home, told my mom what happened. And she kind of told me what happened. He's taking away all your dignity and taking away everything. So that you don't have no pride. You don't have nothing. He's trying to break you. He, he's trying to break you from all your old habits in your old patterns in order for you to be obedient. You can fight him and win, but then you lose. If you take what he's trying to do and you run with it, you're going to learn something. I started listening to the record again. It clicked. I'm playing the notes. I'm not feeling it. I went back to the rehearsal the next day. We started playing. He came around. I'm looking at him like this. I'm like, oh, snap. He came up to me. He whispered in me. He said, that's what I'm talking about. Anytime you say anything about looking inside oneself to find perfection, and that perfection is in everyone. Uh, nobody's perfect, but they can be. We may never reach that, but it's better to drive for it than not. The last record was done at strange hours. I don't know. I think it's rude to call people if it's four in the morning unless their mom just died or something. And uh, also because I wasn't sure if their heads were in the same space mine was as far as where the song came from and stuff. And I think they are understand a little bit more about the way I am. Just from hanging out, you know, we understand one another. So I think they'll probably do the next one. And the stage show is uh, real rough. Uh, the only difference is it's locked louder and harder at so, um, which makes it more aggressive. Well, I like to do guitar solos. And I have a great guitar player who, um, yeah, I mean, you could say he's pretty heavy.
By the time we got to the 1999 record, you know, we'd been in this rhythm of Prince does a record. We we go out, we tour that record, rehearse the record, and in an infinite number of of iterations and variations. Between 1999 and and Purple Rain was the breakdown. There was the breakthrough, but then there was the breakdown. The preparation for Purple Rain happened while I was at the band. The, the screenwriter um, that wrote the initial screenplay and script literally was on the bus with us for the first, you know, couple of months of the tour. And the script writer, he could get the characters. Drawing from real events to, to begin to, to write this script. We were about to do this film. We were well aware of it. The conflict is we want him to play a song of ours and he doesn't want to play it. It's a struggle to let him know that we do care about his contribution yeah. to his career in the film. The combination of Wendy and Lisa in the film and the, the tension over the songs, even though the script was originally written, it was a conflict between Prince and I. The act was increasingly centered around sexual things and, and blatantly sexual things and, and oftentimes things that were just patently designed to shock people and nothing more. When you're writing, you don't think of those things. You just try to be the instrument rather than the, an editor. But um, there's the reality of, of these kids and, and what we're saying and what we're doing. Um, I don't really respond to what society says. You know, we don't use words like wholesome or, you know, bad or good. You know what I mean? I've always been the type of person that danced to the beat of my own drum, so. I mean, on the one hand, we were rock stars. What I'd always wanted to be, I was. It's fun. I don't let other people define what it is that makes me up. That conflict became so tangible. I just became so unhappy. It was this incredible turmoil because it was not making me happy. And the more it didn't make me happy, the more I was thinking, why isn't this making me happy? In, in regard to my involvement in the band, it came to a head on that 1999 tour. It's like it is with your biological brothers. You know, you may love each other, but there comes a point, you know, where you're teenagers where you know you you start <laughs> you start throwing hands and and you know trying to knock one another out. I mean, I was thrilled to be going back to being the guy in in the middle of the stage singing the songs and talking to the audience, and that was where I felt most comfortable. The brand value that had been built up as as the guy in, in the Kamikaze headband, we were able to kind of cash in on some of that. Toured with Billy Idol, the Rebel Yell tour, which was. Probably the most enjoyable tour that I, out of all of them. He heard me play in a hotel room once, and in he a hotel thought, room. yeah, he thought I was great. He thought I was really good, and then he gave me a call back and asked me if I'd like to join in, and I said I'd be more than happy to. The bands weren't speaking because the time could kick their ass, and often did. He created a monster, and then couldn't deal with it. Didn't take long to learn a lot of it had to do with what had happened with Jimmy Jam and Terry. We were kicked out by the royal hoof, hoof, pomp, pomp, whatever, of Prince. And, uh, but like I said, it was a business thing. We're best of friends now. That's right. Prince, we love you, man. Yes, yeah. long before I was a producer, I was just a musician. That's all I did. You used to work for PR in production. I used that to was, work for PR, was... which is Paisley Park now. Actually, you know, I've worked with Prince. We did the controversy tour with Prince, which was supposed to go overseas. He said, I don't want to get my ass kicked overseas. Then the 1999 tour, once again, we were supposed to go overseas. We had our passports, everything ready to go. Once again, ass kicking. We didn't even play New York and L.A. Ass kicking was getting so bad. So we didn't make it overseas. I was a roadie for the time. Was a valet for the time. A bodyguard for the time. Bodyguard. Okay. No, you took the mirror off the wall then. A mirror man for the, the time. Mirror man. I went from the side of the stage onto the stage. Onto with the, the time. stage. And onto the album cover. And onto the album cover. Terry and Jimmy had already begun their productions. And I heard the songs. I was like, Dude, you know, guys, these are incredible. We were in New York City. Here we're here in New York. We were here in New York, Radio City. Row was huge at that time. Every celebrity you could think of was there to see Prince and was wondering where the hell we were. We arrived to the hall and we found out, we find out when we get there that we're not playing, okay? I am mean, I don't blame them because it was like we were all in New York and we never even got to play. We had two days off in New York after that day. But it was that particular show that when those guys left New York and went to Atlanta, it was that after that particular really depressing ordeal. And, he's, I don't, and, and that's mm -hmm. when those guys went to Atlanta. I guess they were told not to go record other songs for other people. And they did that. Anyway, we had a show. We had never missed a gig. They got snowed in somewhere. This particular show we had in Atlanta, I think. We'd gone to Atlanta to do SOS Band. 
or were they in Atlanta? It's bound to be one of Atlanta's most memorable winter snowstorms. In the morning, the, the whole snowstorm happened. We thought of every possible scenario. Booked ourselves on 10 different flights, and they <laughs> all canceled. It was the worst day of my life. We're in the Atlanta airport. We were up and down for eight hours. And what's taking off? Anybody taking off? Anybody? We missed the gig in San Antonio. It hadn't snowed during 50 years, literally 50 years. The next day, we were in San Antonio. They missed the show. We played the show in San Antonio. And... The night that Terry and Jimmy missed, Prince played. Prince was off to the side playing bass. And, and Lisa played keyboards. They strapped me up with a bass. I don't play the bass. And put me in front of the mic. They rolled them to the end of the tour and fired them. It was more stay in the time. They've been rivals of mine since... 1982. We're going to do a movie about this. He could see this. And you know, he used to tell us that he had dreams about the movie, the first tour, the controversy in 1999 tour. That's his whole thing. He was obsessed. I really wanted to chronicle the life I was living at the time. My love of rock music and living in Minneapolis, a lot of great talent and a lot of rival rivalries. Uh, the time and I, uh, we were at uh, a very good place musically. I'm competitive. Prince is a super competitive individual so we were always cool until you know we started touring there was a competitiveness that existed from when they were young kids once he realized that he had created this frankenstein monster then you know that's when the tension came in after that happened the group proceeded to record the ice cream castles lp full flip the ice cream castles i went to do my purple ring and we uh you know things were feeling different we had lost you know two of our our key members and uh, the group just didn't feel the same anymore. Prince and myself were starting to kind of separate a little bit. You know, I was kind of doing my own thing. He was really engulfed in whatever his vision was with, with the movie and with the music. Uh, he did his scenes on different days than I would do mine unless we had scenes together. And so I would have to say that Purple Rain was really kind of when we started to, like, distance ourselves. We would be on the set every morning at 5.30, but we wasn't shooting. No, it wasn't no hurry up and wait. Just didn't want us to be doing anything else. So you'd be on the set every day, full makeup, dress, <laughs> and ain't shooting or nothing. Just had just so he would know where, uh, where's Jesse. I know where he's over there. Okay. The tension between him and Prince at this point was boiling over. And Morris wasn't even there. Morris wasn't even coming to rehearsals. When he he didn't have to come to rehearsals. And I was never uh, officially the guy that runs this. If he knew arrangements he wanted to add or whatever or not, I was the guy. Morris walked in one day. He was always like my idol. He came in high collar, clean as hell, ascot, looked amazing, hair laid, everything came in clean as hell. He wasn't late. Prince walked up to him. And Prince got in his face. This morning, he, he wasn't that one. Because he walked up to him, man, you know you're like, <laughs> and Morris know. is like, mama. <laughs> You know, and more shut these. I was wow. like, yeah, it's about no, I'm like, time around this moment. <laughs> and inside, I'm like, yeah, shoot whoop his ass, you know? But I'm thinking if we do that, I know Prince, we're done. We're going to be done totally. So I grabbed Morris. And Bean jumped in. Hey, yo, get your friends, yo. Man, get your ass off the way. Let these tie this shit out. And put him back. And big chick grabbed Prince. It's a lot of cussing going back and forth. Morris is like, mama, hi, blah, 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 blah. And what the f but, uh, you know, Morse also know he needed to do this movie. It's like, I know we needed to do it. There was no movie out like that at the time. I expected it, I, I, I think, because there was, like I said, there was nothing out like it at the time. It was a movie in a movie. There was a lot of trouble, a lot of actors were, you know, Bob and I had to do some babysitting with Morris Day. I made 50 grand and that was it. And I had to use that 50 grand to pay my band weekly. <laughs> So he said, I'm going to take your songs from the movie and put them on your own record and I will have the soundtrack out. Because everything was so strategic with this dude. I knew that it was somehow cutting me out of something. <laughs> when he's like, I'm not sharing the movie money with you. This dude was shrewd. They did one show with that unit, the Purple Rain version of the time at First Avenue to basically introduce the band. I, I questioned it. You know, uh, to me... That was really the beginning of the end. The bird was supposed to be on the album. And we had a studio version of that song. Right, bring the house lights up. I like it like that. The studio version was super funky, clean, and it was hard hitting. Prince said, you know what? <laughs> he said, we're going to do the bird live. He said, you guys are going to record the song live in First Avenue, and we're going to use that version on the album. This is my show. We're going to take up a collection, you know? 
like they do in church. I'm going to get how many months I was in the band before we did our first gig, but we, we played at First Avenue once when I was in the band. Y'all had to excuse me. I was going to mention this earlier, but I forgot. I'm not above that. Now, as we all know, Brother Prince played here a week or two ago, and from what they tell me, he charged $25 a head. I don't know about you, but I stayed home that night. That's just a little steep. Deal! Just give it till it hurts, you know what I'm saying? And that was recorded for in the truck in the back of First Avenue for Purple Rain. Right, fellas, that's that enough. was the end of that. So we filmed the movie and the Morris was gone. We got a show to do and we realize that. Anybody see Jerome, if they do, you know, send him back up to the stage. I know you did like I would do if it was in your position. Prince, are you out there? Did you give? You took? Did you give? You took. Did you give all that? Yeah, I remember him because he was, you know, talking stuff at, at the end of that thing. I think he kind of liked that rivalry aspect of it. I mean, God, they had it for forever growing up. Why wouldn't they keep that going? I think it was a... Uh, I think those guys had a special brotherly relationship that, that was built on competition. And I knew that, I you know, they were making digs at each other, but, you know, that wasn't my, my dig to make. So we tried to make that work, but Morris was definitely not into it. Morris, like, disappeared. Couldn't find me for a long time because he didn't want to be a part of it anymore. So when I knew he was out, then I left. At the end of that show, Morris stormed off the stage. Everybody else went to the dressing room to open up a bottle of beer, whatever. Hey, good show. Morris didn't take his coat off didn't stop and say a word to the band. He walked down the steps. And I went out the back door. Through that room, into his car. My Porsche. And left. And that was it. That was it. So after we shot the uh, scenes, and that was the last time anybody saw me until I resurfaced uh, in California. So that was it for me. This is it. I'm in LA. I'm staying. So I was basically out of the band. Mm -hmm. This was bigger than I ever imagined. We went from rock stars to now we got Hollywood. My wishes and prayers were for that album and that movie to become successful. It was like, I don't know what it was like. Man, when we walked that carpet, I was like, what? I was tripping. We did it like royalty. Because it was a rock and roll film, and you hadn't seen one of those in a long time. Why are you a Prince fan? This Prince is bad. In 84 at the Chinese Man's Theater. The yeah, the premiere. People were going crazy in the red carpet. I was like, oh, wait a minute. It was blowing up. What time is it, it was just a whole nother level of intensity. Yeah, right. It's well, a different shit going on here, yeah. you know. Well, I had to break the situation between Morris and Prince. We saw the premiere of the movie. Me and Morris go into the theater. We sit down. Prince was kind of salty when he saw Morris. And every time Prince's picture came up on the screen, there was a group of girls that would scream. Mm -hmm. Morris looked at me and he goes, he paid them. <laughs> Both of them are amazingly funny guys. Split second, it's like shots fired. Got a duck. Words doesn't harm me. You know I mean? um, even though it was in the movie at the time, at times I was able to tap into some real emotions because there was some of that stuff really going on. So um, it was real, just as much as it was, um, you know, Hollywood. He just doesn't talk to anybody. And Morris was there too. He was there. I went over and I sat down next to him. He was sitting alone. And I said, "Dude, what's the problem with you and Morris, man?" And he said, "Well, Morris, his mother called me a devil." I said, "But are you a devil?" He goes, "Like, no." I said, "Morris loves you like a brother." Prince didn't give me any feedback, so I went to Morris and I said, "Man, Prince is just not right right now." And then Morris said, all right, man, let's just jet. We got a couple of girls from Hollywood, and we left. And then I want to see some lovely young ladies. He was changing, man. He was just different. I had already threatened to leave. I wanted to produce my own record and write for myself. He had uh, Cavallo come up to my place in Santa Monica. Morris, he never wanted it. He said, so I talked to Prince about this, and Prince said, that's fine. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. You know, we talked it through, and... He said, as long as he can be the executive producer. I knew what that meant. That meant the same different day. I get it, it's time for me to move on. I don't think in terms of fighting. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think that you win anything by fighting. I'm the type of person that likes to look at things for exactly the way they are. Everybody was trying to get to Mars Day. The performance that he did in the film 
Morris was a star. All media contacted Prince's people in California. Prince had told them, if anybody asks for Morris, tell them that Morris is not available. Next thing I know, he's calling me up, you know, saying, you got to help me, man. Prince is trying to destroy me. Prince was holding up all the money. They had the same accountant. It was a $17,000 tax return from the federal government that Mars was supposed to get that was at the office. Prince and his accountant was in Europe at the time, which was lucky for us. If he helped you to him, he owned you. And he was just getting ready to get kicked out of his apartment because he hadn't paid the rent. You know, I would disappear into my binges. I don't remember ever seeing Morris on drugs. He hit it really well with prints on you, squeezing and pushing. I'm sure that was tough for him. So I went in off the radar, you know, for a month, but I was sneaking out to the clubs. I wasn't taking it serious. I flew to California and met his apartment in Santa Monica. We called the office. Mars' mother called the office and said, look, that's his money. You'll get in trouble with the, with the government. So you make sure you courier that money right over to us, that check. We got it. Mars cashed the check. We got his Porsche out of the shop. He caught up on his rent, and then I started building his team for him. Went up to the president of Warner Brothers, Mo Austin, and I said that Prince had a contract with Morris, and the royalty rate was too low. So Mo Austin had moved up his royalty rate to like 16% and said, don't tell Prince. That's what I had to do. I had to pay him 300 Gs to get out of my contract. Basically, could do what you wanted to do. So, solo album is what happened. And, and I had gotten so used to him being around. It's, yeah. It's, because now you had done everything with Prince, but Prince wasn't, for the first time, not really involved. Yeah, and you know what? You've come to the point where you do have to figure it out. Because <laughs> I always had him yeah. to fall back on. He had a hard time letting go of people once everybody started leaving. You know, vanity's about. Listen, what's the film The Last Dragon about? It's a martial arts film um, and a love story intertwined. I am a video DJ, like yourself. We hear you're working on another film right now, as a matter of yes. fact, Never Too Young to Die with Gene Simmons. Yes, you that's going to be a doozy. I play spy. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to do this film, this particular Never Too Young to Die. It's in what you would call pre-production. You think you may be actually going more into a motion picture direction? God, I hope that I can stick to both. I want to. I think that I'll, I'll, I'll probably have to pace myself. Your relationship with Prince, is that still all right? People ask me that question constantly. Well, I was, I, we really don't know, so we're wondering right. where that relationship stands right. today. Well, the relationship, we don't talk. Morris left by this time. Mr. Morris Day. Morris. Well, I play the, um, the villain. No, this is my first uh, endeavor, uh -huh. uh, acting endeavor. Uh, you're a very young man, aren't you? Fairly young. You have uh, a lot of women pursuing you? I found that before the release of the movie. <laughs> stars in rock and roll music and now film stars and actually the major mo movies are being made there. How, do how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, I gotta tell you. Um, no, I really don't know. It's, um, it's a mystery to me, you know. I just happen to be there. <laughs> Is it, uh, now you, you and Prince went to high school together, right? No, we didn't. <laughs> but, yeah, that's, yeah, that's... Bring out that other one, okay? You knew, yeah. you knew Prince in high school. Yeah, I knew him in high school. But you didn't go together to No, we, we played in a group together, and uh, we played at different high schools together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, are you guys still uh, good friends? Were you... Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do now? What's next? You got another film? We're considering some films at this point, and I'm um, getting ready to go in the studio and do the Morris Day album. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, will you work with Prince again? I don't think so. Um, yeah. I, is there is there friction between the two of you? I sense that there's. Are you sensing this? Yeah. Is there? Is there? <laughs> I was ready to go. Jesse Johnson, our guitarist, landed a solo deal, and after that, I was like. It's time to go because Morris Day had to do what Morris Day does best. Personally, didn't see any other avenue for me to go. I don't think that then people could accept Morris Day trying to be a balladeer. After finishing Purple Rain and all that, I think my check was like $330. The Ice Cream Castle album, I'm produced by Jamie Starr, co-produced by Jesse Johnson. It wasn't known there on the publishing yet. I don't even think Jungle Love said my name on the record, though. It came off years ago because he was, Prince was vindictive when you left him.
I don't necessarily remember any conversation or, nor, or was I privy to any conversation about the time continuing with Jesse being the front man. They may have had that conversation. No, I, when I left, I left. Never, because the time was his thing. It was his baby. To this day, he'll tell you, I, I have major respect for hierarchy, but I respect him greatly. It's his thing, and I never step on anybody's toes during that thing. At that point of time, everybody wanted to sign someone from Minneapolis. So I'm sure there was a few more zeros attached to Jesse's offer than Prince was going to offer him. I signed as a production company, not as Jesse Johnson. So that's why I could go. I, if you look at that period, I'm on all kinds of stuff, doing everything everywhere. John McClain was my A&R guy, and, and, and um, he signed me. Mm -hmm. So I, the only artist I think I, he'd sign at that point in time. But... Um, really sad we, we never reached the purple rain yeah. thing and because we were supposed to go on tour yeah i wanted to go on it was going to be our first time out without prince it was going to be on our own merit and so that was the whole thing we were never ever ever planned prince was you kidding me prince was so sick of us putting our foot in his ass after the 1999 tour he wasn't taking us in the backyard
Jesse decided to go. Time was no longer. Prince came to us in this little warehouse that uh, was in Eden uh. Prairie. And he said, well, Morris is gone. Jesse's gone. Who wants to stay? We're going to do a new band, and you're going to be the lead singer. And he pointed at me. The next thing I know, right when we found out you had left, I got a phone call from A&M Records that said, come in, I want you to produce Janet Jackson's record. Come in and have a meeting with me. So I went down to Charlie Chaplin Studios, A&M, John McClain. He said, I'm not here to talk to you about Janet Jackson. I just want to get you in the door. I want to steal you away from Prince. I'm like, what? No, that ain't happening, bro. But then he started pointing things out. My head started turning, and I started thinking about these things. And, of course, he's flashing dollars in front of me. And Prince found out people were going crazy. The band was going to break up. I talked to Paul. Baby, bro, just stay for this record. Say, we go out and tour. After that, you can do whatever the hell you want. I remember being saying, baby, bro, you got to do what you want to do. We'll be all right. Let's make this as big as we can. And then you just tell Prince, like, dude, I'm gone. Negotiations are going south. Prince. Prince called me. You need to get your boy. You know, just like when Terry and Jimmy missed the flight. Where were your boys? You need to talk to them. You know, always it built back on me. I gotta remember, I'm a 20 year old kid, and this is possibly the greatest opportunity I'd ever have to do my own music. Like I said, that's life changing for an 18 year old kid. Oh boy, that was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Whether it was right or wrong, I guess we'll never know. I called him in France and just said, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. He just said, Well, if that's what you're going to do, see ya. Of course, he was upset. So Prince had a fit. Paul, you were telling Prince, the only person that is going to have control over this is you. And you're off making a movie and you don't have the ability to be able to control everything that needs to be controlled. He said, oh, no, I can do that. I can do that. I did it with the time. Well, no, he didn't do it with the time. <laughs> the only reason the family began was because he lost control of the time. The time. Freeze, freeze. 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 Me and Jerome were the last two from the, you know, sort of sitting there, and we were the ones he clung really hard to. You tired too? And almost forced us to stay. From Purple Rain to a group called The Family, the Prince and the Revolution. Prince and Revolution? I did Under the Cherry Moon. But you know what I liked about that movie? Me. You. From Under the Cherry Moon on to my, do my solo career. From there... With Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis production. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis production. Dancing with that one girl. Control. That Jackson girl. Now people working with me recognizes those talents, so they, they pay for them. I have no ego. I know exactly who I am. Prince is really like you spend a lot of time with him on, obviously. Way back to this, Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know I'm going to ask you that, man. I forgot what Prince was like. Oh, God. Uh, how much uh, that long ago did he fire? I mean, that you quit? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in there, you're trying to a thin line there. Oh, Prince is cool. He's all right with me, you know. He's doing his thing now. And he's got his little movie coming out. Mm -hmm. So that's basically all I have to say about Prince right now. It was great. It was fun. It was a learning experience. You learn how businesses run the way he runs it, and then, and you accept the things that he has to offer. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, he teaches you things. Yeah. In a weird way, but you learn from it. Right. For now, so. Okay. I understand that you have a, a recording deal. Yeah, I have a two album, three movie recording deal with A M Records. Uh -huh. Thanks to John McClain. You weren't going to see that vulnerable side of him. His beloved time was breaking up, you know, his childhood with a part of himself, and that was disbanding, and all of his brothers were leaving. But he had no intention to keep the Apollonia 6 thing going as a long-term project uh, in any way. Hannah wanted to continue with her acting to cross over from the American market. Her point, she really hadn't done very much in the white market, and she even wanted to finish her education. He was not happy that I signed at Warner's. And it was his managers that were able to negotiate that. Even though Prince called me and said he liked the album, he liked the song Since I Fell For You, it didn't do very well because he's upset. But I think he wanted me to be on girl songs. You know, he wanted me to stay in Minnesota. And the fact that I went separate on my own with the same record label, with the same managers, I think upset him. So I finally went to Mo Austin and I said, he's the money maker here. You know you're not doing anything for me. Let me go. And I asked him to release me from my contract. I had a seven-year contract. And he let me go. I have still music in Spanish at Warner's. I walked out of there with boxes of all my material and didn't look back. I think it's just personality. Yeah. You know, I think it's personality. I've, I've been with uh, one band all my career. Through the years, we've had different keyboard players, different guitar players, different vocalists. But I've been with, like, the same two drummers, Morris and Jelly Beans. 
-hmm. Now, uh, drummers are really solid and stable people. Singers have a problem with, with a lot of things. They have, like, different attitudes because they're out front. They're a solo instrument. Mm -hmm. They have the attitude, I am the star. The first Alexander O'Neill record we did took six months to do. The Hearsay album only took, like, three months to do. Oh, Alex, yeah, I'll be back in the States, man. I, I'm just finishing up this interview, man. Uh, Tina Easton has a hit record out entitled Sugar Walls, and it was written by a gentleman by the name of Alexander Nevermind, who many people allege is Prince, one of his uh, pseudo names. And uh, a lot of people say he's sending a message to you uh, through that. Uh, how do you respond to that? Now, please welcome Alexander O'Neill. <laughs> I was kicked out before I got kicked in. Prince had already decided that I guess I'm uncontrollable or whatever. Uh, some people even said that his reply that I was too black. But see, Prince is black when it's convenient for Prince to be black. Alexander O'Neill have to be black and love being black all the time. He just added fuel for the fire. So I said, now nah, I'm really gonna make it. Well. You know, Doug, that could that could very well be true, that he's sending a message to to Alexander O'Neill, but uh, I don't uh, interpolate that as a lot of people probably think I do. Uh, I happen to feel that that's a very very positive thing, and and definitely coming from Prince, it's a compliment, you know, and that's the way that I take that. Did a demo with Terry and Jimmy with Janet, Nasty Girls, and she didn't like it. I thought that was a Prince song, but she didn't think it was her image. He drove by my house right after the Control album came out. He like threw the CD out the window. I took it as an insult. And I did her about her, keep your eye on me, and Diamonds. I was doing really well. You know, John McClain seen something in me that he liked. Here comes an opportunity. I was happy to do those things because it was based on me and who I am and what I provide. I was a couple hundred thousand dollars down the line. <laughs> Had a deal on the table at Fox. We're going to the Grammy Awards. I was staying at the um, La Park Hotel. That Prince was staying at the La Park. We were both in limousines and we were leaving and this limo pulled up next to me and the window came down and Prince was in it. You know, he said, I like that song. He said, that song you got out by Jody, I like that. He said, you need to put some changes in it, though. But it's number one. <laughs> Terrence, Jody Wally! <laughs> thank God, thank my producers, Andre Simone. Andre sliding in with Jody. Uh, as far as on the women level, Andre kind of outpaced him. Uh, there was a read from home base that he overlooked. Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, mm -hmm. and Janet. I'd like to thank all the great artists we worked with this year. Force MDs, Patty Austin, Sherelle, Alexander O'Neill, the SOS Band, the Human League, Janet Jackson, because they all need to share in this. Because without them, we have nothing to produce, right? Um, yes! I love Jimmy and Terry, but that first Janet Jackson record, they totally took all the licks from Prince. If you listen to it, it's the same grooves. I got fired because I was hanging out with Janet Jackson and Herb Alpert and Ron Isley doing videos. They hired me for what I learned around Prince. I was playing both sides of the fence, like you said. That's a fair way for them to think. Back then, you know, we were taking the elements of what we do to even bigger folks. We're going to mess with Janet. What he said in that <laughs> was letting me go. He said, uh, so you did Janet's video, huh? I was like, yeah. He said, uh, and play both sides of the fence. You know, I was there. I said, were you? He said, yeah, I was parked down the street. 
you put that hat on because you didn't think I would know who you were, huh? Don't take care of you. Uh, good luck. <laughs> and I said, you knew that was me? <laughs> I wasn't mad at him. I was stunned. I had an album. The album was named Shaka Deli. The album was on fire. I had a single on the charts. Number one at the time, the song was Sly Stone. Crazy, crazy for you. Susan Rogers kept calling. She said, Jesse Prince wants to be, I want to go to dinner, dinner with you, your girl. I mean, think he was with Susanna there. So they wanted to go out to dinner. I said, oh, man, I'm cool. Because when I left, I left. You know? Susan Rogers said he's sending you this song. Y'all yeah, know this song, the song is Shocker Now, when he sent me the song, I played the song and said, Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I don't, I, don't need, I don't need this song. It's like, you keep that. Shocker Delica. The album is out. If somebody has an album, if the album is called Lollipop, then there's a song called Lollipop and all that. Notice there's no writing on the cover. That was me being, you know, kind of trying to be cool and doing something different. He said, if you don't put it out, I will put it out. And he said, when they think of Shaka Delica, they will think of me. He was 20-something years old, and he was the patriarch of this organization. And that's a really weird role with a group of friends. Once he got rid of that and just started having people there, the new kind of family he created, they were on the payroll, not as close as the ones that we had at the very beginning. A lot of the managers and people that he brought on, they start to play key roles into whether your relationships will be sustainable or not because these were white people managing mm -hmm. him. Uh, their whole idea was, we want to get him in Rolling Stone. We want him to be this. So let's just X out everything black about him yeah. if we can. He turned a lot of his relationships into transaction relations. They all became transactional. It changes your dynamic. You're the one in the band. You're all friends. But then you're writing the checks. And you've got other people telling you, you're paying this one too much. And then there's this one. It's a really big adjustment. Yeah. And I think it took Prince down a lonely road. See, what it is is that the people around me, in this world, I only have friends to bounce things off of, no matter what it is. If you wear a piece of clothing or whatever you do, it's that's all you have. It changes your dynamic. You're the one in the band, you're all friends, but then you're writing the checks and you've got other people telling you, you're paying this one too much. And then there's this one. It's a really big adjustment. Yeah. Prince started traveling separate from the band. That, for me, was hard. We knew the guy, but the professional persona was somebody who was pretty mysterious and very powerful and sort of a lone wolf. But we started getting so close that the lone wolf started going away. You know, I, I don't, um, I'm not a real social person. You know, I don't hang out a lot. You know, I have my friends, but. We were still writing a lot of stuff on the road and we were still being productive, but there started to be this thing. It hurt. I, I was like, well, how come he's just in that limo by himself and taking a Learjet to the next thing and the band is on a bus? I think we all each need our individual spaces and then we come together with the things that we've concocted in our heads. I think that they love me so much and I love them so much that if I said that, they would come all the time and then I would be able to be to them what I am and they would be able to do for me what they do for me. Prince would call us into his dressing room and just simply say, I'm going to end the band. Play like you've never played before. You know, he was trying to light a fire under us to play extra hard. He respected them, but when it came to who's the boss, there was never any question. You know, I don't think we really needed to learn that. I think we knew that. It was a difficult growing pain for us, was to be separated from him like that. So even though things were like suddenly like grand and all this money and bodyguards carrying my bags and, you know, great hotel rooms, I still kind of felt a little sad and kind of lost. Because of the way they had made the movie, the way it was marketed, because of the way Prince treated them, the revolution had forgotten that they were basically sidemen to a superstar. The movie is what woke me up to that. The level of narcissism I started witnessing. I'm talking about everybody. You're huge, you're big, 
That's what started to shift and change. We all suddenly felt like we don't matter anymore. Now that Purple Rain has made you such a huge superstar, do you worry about the possibilities of a backlash against you? I'm not afraid of a backlash. I don't live in a prison. I haven't built any walls around myself. I'm just like anyone else, and I don't really consider myself a superstar. He refused to have business conversations with his band members or really any employee. It's like I have management, talk to the business manager or the tour manager or my personal manager, but not me. I don't do that. You'll have a manager, you'll have a, an attorney, you'll have a, um, various record company people. Everybody's taking a cut of everything that you do. But we weren't making any money, right? Well, maybe we should just ask for a small, just a little raise. It wasn't much, and I'm not even gonna get into the price, but. It was just the idea of it. It really didn't sit well with him. Once you've opened that can of worms, you can never close it again. We had to accept, okay, we're the band, but it really is about Prince. You know, he was, he was pretty cold-blooded about that. It's like, this is what I want right now, so I don't care what anybody thinks. It's unique about the situation that I'm in now with these people is that they all know who they are. The revolution was great at what they did. They weren't going to take him further. Everybody in that band, this was their first real taste of anything major. And all they knew was this. They'd all come from bar bands. I come from a bar band. We get conditioned to play a certain way when you play in cover tunes all the time. Each one of us experienced him differently. I like, I like to try to um, let musicians that are in my group influence me. It was starting to become a superstar. I was kind of like, you know, I kind of want to do this myself again. You know, I was kind of getting the sense. He was kind of growing a little tired of it. Mm -hmm. And it, we're a lot, we're a handful. We weren't just sidemen. You know, we were the revolution. You know, there was a lot of internal stuff going on. He could cut to your heart and talk about your faults and your mama. You know, all you had to do was be at one rehearsal and see how he talked to the band. Other people wanted to sign us to labels and have us do our own record. Me and Lisa were highly sought after at the time. Wendy and Lisa kind of had enough in Minneapolis at one point, so. Wendy and Lisa and he had had a disagreement which precipitated them wanting to leave. And we didn't want to go. It's very difficult to say no to somebody that you love making music with and then you turn around and say, no, I can't afford to give you a raise. I had to go to the airport to, to convince them. So, you know, I knew kind of, we all knew something was going on and. But right before a tour, you know, people were going to be put out of work. With Prince, it's like he knew he had to go to Japan and we knew we had to do this, but... People were going to lose money. So Prince said, no, 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 I don't, I don't want you to quit. Don't quit. By rescue and mission to bring them back, you know, it's always an odd kind of feeling. We, we played the music. Um, they had smoothed things over, and I thought for sure they were still going to be in the group. He may have harbored that a little bit, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and I think he um, kind they of... They didn't like anybody to leave him. We hear rumors that the revolution may be recording an album of its own. I don't know. It, it'll be too strange. <laughs> They, they're very talented people, but they're, and together we're, so I'd rather stay here than. And from the people that love me the most. Get this sense of privilege. That's the wealth and celebrity. It felt like something was going on. There was no doubt in my mind that Sheila was going to be the drummer in the band. He was pissed anyway. There was something happening, and he was pissed. That sounds. And there were more people on was... the stage. Like Sheila's band was on the stage. He looked at me a couple times he during like, really out. pivotal <laughs> sections and said, "Lay out." And when he says, "Lay out," Yeah, You're good. out. It's not good. When he looks at you and doesn't want you to play, he says, yeah. lay out. And when he said you it to me, I was like, oh, this is not good. What's going on? And then he looked at me, turned Miko up. I was like, ooh, there's something happening here. And I was panicked. I felt it. I felt it big. And Lisa was like, stop overreacting. Stop overreacting. Dun -dun -dun. And I was like, no, no, I'm telling you, this is it. It's done. And it was like, what? what's going on here? Suddenly it sound check for him to say, you know, don't play, what? It was 
was uh, definitely not in character with what he would do. I mean, he'd throw guitars and stuff, but always throw them at the guitar tech, and they'd catch him. He wasn't like a perfect, like doing a Jimi Hendrix, you know, in a full smash. And then, then that night of the gig was when he smashed his guitars on Purple Rain. Uh-oh, what's happening? Why is he so mad? I even thought, did the crew f something up? The wave was just breaking, and that was it. And when we played Purple Rain that night and he smashed the guitar, I was just, wow. Me and Lisa and Bobby looked at each other and went, so, so really, is this happening? I think it's happening. And we got off stage. By the end, the last gig in Japan, he went on a rant. He, he was, you know, smashing stuff on stage and, you know, he was pretty angry. I knew what a lot of that was about. And we knew it. I looked at Bobby while he was playing drums and I mouthed to him, we're fucked. And Bobby was like, it's over. Destroyed his cloud guitar at the end of Purple Rain. But he did it in a way that was a big you. We just knew it. No, I was still, me out of everybody, too. I mean, I was the most, like, no, it's going to be fine. He does this all the time. It's just another tantrum. But Wendy did. Wendy was like, oh, my God, it's over. He's, he's done. He's going to fire us. That all of this calculated lifestyle affectations of who I designed myself to be as a celebrity, as a human being, and the perception I want people to have of me. Um, Wendy and Lisa and I, Bobby and everybody, I mean, when Sometimes we have talks and they're very few and far in between, but sometimes we have very, very long talks. And I do a lot of the talking, but they'll look at me and whenever we're done, one of them, it's not um, all together, but one of them will come to me and they'll say, just take care of yourself, you know, I really love you. We get back to our hotel room and I said to Lisa, I think we're gonna get fired. I think he's gonna fire us. She's like, why do you have to be so negative? No, he's not. And I said, I just think he's gonna do it. And I was like, no, no, no way. It's cool, we're good. We all flew back to our homes. Uh, Prince flew back to LA, had a rental there. It was like, it was all good. We were doing so much work and we had come so far and it was like, I couldn't understand how he could suddenly just like, er, no, I'm doing something else now. But that's exactly what he did. He had me and Wendy over to dinner. Um, he, we ate dinner and it was kind of a weird vibe, like what's going on? And then he took us upstairs and he started talking about, I want to do a show that's going to be like flashy. And I don't think I can ask you guys to, and he literally said, and I hate to even perpetuate this. I'm going to be going in a different direction and I can't ask you guys to wear nippleless bras and crotchless panties. He said it, and we pretty much said, you're right. No. What about all those songs we just wrote? I mean, he kept a couple things on Sign of the Times, but he took, like, most of our parts yeah, off. Yeah, he just wanted, well, disappear, be gone. I was driving down the street when I heard it on the radio. Didn't know it was even released. Got to the hotel room, saw the premiere video on MTV with him and Wendy. I was pissed. Couldn't even incorporate me in the video. I was heated. Then I got the album cover, the first print on it. If I remember, it said, thanks to Brown Mark for hand claps. It was shocking and sad. And uh, um, I really felt for my bandmates that this was happening. It felt really bad. And then Prince put it as an option to stay or go. You're welcome to stay, but I would understand if you chose to leave now. That's exactly what he said. Right after he disbanded the revolution, he called me out to Paisley 
and he asked me to be in New Power Generation, Sign of the Time Zone. Matt had already uh, contracted with him to do it. I said, Prince, I got to move on. I said, my time is over. I said, I gave you my best years, and I got nothing to show for it. In a sense, it was almost like a test of loyalty, maybe. In hindsight, at the mo at the time, I didn't even think about loyalty. I just thought, oh no, I have no, I have no reason to go at this point. Nope. When guitarist Wendy Melvoin and keyboard player Lisa Coleman left Prince and the Revolution last year, they didn't waste any time. They went right into the studio and they recorded an album, which is just out, called Wendy and Lisa. Leaving Prince wasn't too easy, but Wendy told us it was necessary. We had reached a certain plateau creatively for each other and uh, decided that the best thing for us to do in order to creatively get better was to school ourselves separately for a while in order to make our whole thing better if and when we eventually get back together to offer bigger and better things. It just reached a certain level for us. We all decided it was time to try alone for a while. He's helped us quite a lot. It taught us about professionalism, about integrity, and breaking limits. We were always free, but now that we are living out Wendy and Lisa vision in our music as opposed to Prince's vision. The relationship I have with Mark. Someone remembers me from the movie. I mean, there's one shot in there where I'm looking at my watch. All the dialogue and everything is cut right out of the movie. Hmm. I learned how to be a perfectionist and work hard. And I work my group's hard. Yeah, we're still friends. He called me and congratulated me on the album. Yeah, we don't really talk like buddy buddies, but... <laughs> hey, thanks for coming on the show. Brown Mark, our guest on video saw yeah, the Maserati. Brown Mark's group. He built it from the ground up. My final check with Prince was $50,000. I haven't been paid. I call my manager, their attorneys. Tell us, upon termination of my agreement with Prince, the artist contract between Paisley and Maserati, I will have to pay back the cost of Maserati to be flown out to L.A. to rehearse, the cost of their rehearsal space. I never sent my group, never authorized anything. My lawyer says he made a mistake. There was a clause in my final contract with Prince that if I leave, I will have to pay back $50,000. But it, it was me, Wendy, and Bobby. Bobby was let go of the same time. We actually went and rented a house in Palm Springs for two weeks together and like laid in the sun and like, what are we going to do? I think my attitude changed from the beginning. I think right from the beginning, I just said, I'm committed to this guy and I'm going all the way. You could just do these things. You could produce the miracles. We're going to be on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, sure. You know, bang tour in front of the stones, bang, you know? I mean, he just had the ability to do that through music, and that was, I knew that right away. I mean, I've never been more sure of anything, ever. You decided that uh, you wanted to continue making music in your own right, and as we've said, you've done that. Yeah, I guess so. Is that a track written by yourself? Uh, that song was co-written with a friend of ours, Jesse Johnson. It, it is, and forgive me for saying it, but it, it is very Prince, but he it, sounds like us. Uh, yeah, that's probably a better <laughs> word. Well, you know, you swap and barter and trade and learn and teach yeah, and, exactly. and steal and an give. Oh. And even exchange. And that's, I, I'm very confident of my musicianship. But, you know, as my profession goes, I'm a musician, so. That was the price of doing business his way. It was almost like, be careful what you ask for. You wanted this reclusiveness, Mr. Howard Hughes. Well, now you got it. Can't help but think that at some point he realized and gave some thought to the downside of what he was doing. I've lived here all my life and plan to stay, so uh, I wanted to have all this at my fingertips so that I didn't have to run out to L.A. back and forth in New York. When Paisley Park was being built, we had a conversation where he actually said, could you imagine if we all lived close by? meaning the band and the, the crew and management. And just think, every time we wanted to shop, we could just go to the nearest mall and have them close it down, and we would just have them all do our... And he was being dead serious. It was like we should have this insulated environment where all of us, and then we'll, we'll get somebody to, to home teach all our kids. You know, it was like, it really was dead out of how it used. It was scary. Prince is also busy making one of his songs a reality. On his Around the World in a Day LP, Prince sang about a seemingly mythical place called Paisley Park. Well, he's now in the midst of building a combination record studio, rehearsal hall, and a video soundstage in Chanhassen. 
remember loan a lot and loan me very so that's a basic part about one should find a place in oneself that one can go when one is feeling alone.